Hello, Cheltenham. Um, the man I'm about to introduce you to has seen more of our planet than any other living human and is consequently our most powerful environmental activist. He's the only person in the UK to have won BAFTAs for programmes in black and white and colour <laughs> and HD and 3D and 4K. He's had 15 species of animal or plant named after him, including a weevil. He's written or co-written 27 books. He has 32 honorary degrees, received 35 major awards, and has now graced this planet for 92 years. He is a great educator, a great humanitarian, an actual icon and hero to millions. And in my 32 years of interviewing some truly great people, this is the closest I've ever come to sharing the stage with an actual legend. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir David Attenborough. Uh, I went to the basement of, <laughs> they know what's coming, <laughs> of the House of Fraser department store in Cheltenham to attend a David Attenborough boogie woogie rave. I didn't see you there. <laughs> well, I certainly saw you <laughs> because there were about 600 people all wearing David Attenborough masks, <laughs> dancing with huge cardboard cutouts of David Attenborough and dancing to dance music over which they'd relayed your voice talking about minor birds or something. Have you ever been to one? No. No. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to recommend it to you, but it was a very <laughs> interesting experience. I mean, there must, can't be anybody else in the, in the country who has one of those being held in their honour. Boris Johnson? Maybe. <laughs> Can we start with your childhood? Yes. Your first job was as a newt salesman. Yes. You sold newts to a local museum. To a university college zoology department. They were doing behavioural studies on newts just to get out of the question. I, mean, I wasn't giving them to be doomed to be, go under the scalpel. They were being behaviour. And I was, my father was principal of a university college in Leicester, you see. And uh, the le zoology lecturer was doing these things, and she needed a lot of newts. And I had met her, and I said, I can give you newts. And uh, she said... How old were you? Oh, nine, ten, I think, yeah. And uh, how much? And I did a quick come, penny a newt, penny a newt, you see. So I, I supplied them with them. But the thing she didn't know, at least the way she pretended she didn't know, I don't think she did know, they came from a pond that was in 20 yards of her laboratory. <laughs> <laughs> I, made, I made a fortune. <laughs> well, enough for a Mars bar, yeah. Um, your, your father was an academic. Your mother was an incredible, feisty dame, wasn't she? Yes. Um, she was a suffragette. Yes. And during the war, she took in refugees. Yes. How, how was that for you as a, as a child, as a teenager growing up? Um, well, she, she started with um, Spanish refugees, Basque children in the 30s, before the war, um, when, in fact, the Nazis bombed uh, uh, Guernica, you know? And um, a group of, them, of, of people in this country, including my mother, decided they ought to get the children out. Which, so they organized, I think it was several hundred Basque children came out. And, uh, and they, they found a, a disused country house in Leicestershire. And, and she organized them and, and, and got them there. Um, and then, then when the war came, um, my father, as you said, was an academic. Um, and he organized, he was involved in uh, arranging for the children of, of Jewish academics in Germany uh, to, to come out. And, and for the most part, they didn't stay in this country, but they went on to relatives in the United States and so on. 
Um, and they, they would, they, to do that, he had to give, they, my parents had to give a guarantee that if anything happened, they would look in, look, um, become their parents in loco parentis. Um, and um, we had two uh, German girls staying with us when um, uh, a transport taking refugee children to America was sunk by the Nazis. And that stopped passages. So I remember very well, my, my mother came down and said, um, well, uh, Richard David John, I had two brothers, Richard David John, um, you now have two sisters. Um, you, they will now become sisters to you and we will treat them as though you're your sisters because they don't have any parents. And so they need, if anything, they need us more than you do. And I thought at the time, I'm not too, not sure about this. <laughs> uh, you know how eight children are. And, uh, but we grew to love them, and they were our sisters, and, and they stayed with us throughout the war. Um, and in 1946, they went to America, but we stayed in contact all the time. Is that, is that one of the reasons, one of the many reasons, why you've been so outspoken in support of refugees coming into this country? It's one of the reasons, uh, I suppose. Uh, uh, yes. I, um, and we all, how do we know how much we get from our parents and our parents' attitudes? But certainly that's their attitude, which uh, I, uh, I respect. And uh, I would like to think I felt the same way. Your, your father was very strict, wasn't he? I yeah. mean, I know he wanted you to go to university, but did he not say to you that you had to get a scholarship? Because if you didn't get a scholarship, it meant you probably didn't deserve to go. That's exactly it. I mean, in the 30s, um, the, people forget that there wasn't a system to allow almost everybody to get into university. But you had to, certainly Oxford and Cambridge, you had to pay for it unless you could get a, a scholarship. And, uh, and he said, I mean, he was as the uh, head of a very small university college in the Midlands, he wasn't very well paid. And he said, if you, if you can't get a scholarship, my son, you can't go. Uh, so you better get a scholarship. And, and so I, I, I certainly wanted to go to university to discover about animals and so on. Um, and it was during the war, well, just at the end of the war, my, my father, well, we had a, an, an allotment down at the bottom of the garden. And I remember it was <laughs> my father coming out of the house, waving a telegram in the air, which we had in those days, and coming and running down towards me and saying, you've got it, my son, you've got it. And uh, I, I thought it was good at the time, but, but, but now I have to say it, it, it makes me feel fairly emotional because he was, he was a man I loved very much. Um, you went to Cambridge. Yes. You studied natural sciences. Yes. You learned about animals. You didn't yes. become a scientist, but you certainly did your degree in that subject. And then two years in the Navy. And then you applied to work at the BBC in the sound department yes. or producing radio programmes. Yes. And I didn't get the job. I mean, I didn't, I didn't even get an interview. I just got a, a letter saying, thank you very much, um, but we don't need you. And... Um, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> uh, and then about a fortnight later, I was working for a publisher as an editorial assistant. Um, and about a fortnight later, I got another letter that said, um, I'm uh, from the BBC saying, we are now starting a, a, a thing which is uh, a lot of people are rude about, um, but we think there's quite a lot in it. I mean, it's called television. <laughs> uh, and um, we want to get somebody, persuade somebody to come along and work for it. Would you be interested? And I tell you, the editorial job I had, I was interested in anything. I was selling newspapers would be interesting. So I said, yes, yes. And we went up to Alexander Palace. Uh, and it was absolute magic. I mean, here um, was two tiny studios, nowhere near as big as this, about oh, less than a quarter as big as this room, this hall. And we had two. And those two studios, all television was live. There were no that we couldn't afford. They hadn't got enough money to pay for film, so all these, pro all the programmes came from these two small studios. Even the dramas were live. Dramas were live, yes. And what is more, that they did, they they did plays, which they, they did it. They repeated them. They, they were on a Sunday and on a Thursday, 
and that meant they did it, did, played it the second time. I mean, they performed it the second time. So you could either see it on the Sunday to see what the critics said about it, and that would be interesting, or else you could wait till Thursday when they probably knew their lines, which is <laughs> even, even better. Um, and uh, so it was just a, a scene changes. We did operas, all sorts of stuff. I, and, and I joined, and I did all kinds of programs. I did gardening programs, discussion programs. There were knitting programs. Can you imagine that? Knitting programs every week for 15 minutes. Well, there you are. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and travel programs and all sorts. And, and, and it was just an archaeological quiz called Animal, Vegetable, Mineral, which I used to produce. So it was, it was live television was an, an amazing experience. Um, and of course, it could only be seen in London to start with. But uh, during the time they were building transmitters, uh, first one went up to Sutton Coalfield to Bristol, uh, to Birmingham, and then another one down to Bristol and so on. And so television spread over uh, the country. And you, it was a time, it was like drinking champagne. I mean, it was so, so exciting, you can't imagine. We all watched everybody else's programs, you know. We all didn't really want to go home very much, you know. We, we would stay on if we could help in any way at all. Uh, and um, you, it was a very good grounding in, in television techniques. I think you must have been pretty incredible at it because you were then made, don't know how many of you know this, but David was made the controller of BBC Two. Yeah, that was 10 years later. Uh, yes, ten years later, at least twelve, twelve years later. And yeah. it was, it was, it was. Y you, you were in charge of the Old Grey Whistle Test, of Call My Bluff, of Monty Python. But my favourite thing about your period when you were the controller, you only the second controller they ever had, was that you turned down an application to be a presenter from um, Mr. Terry Wogan. Did I? Yeah. <laughs> Another mistake. Yeah. He kind of managed to get in the back door somehow. <laughs> um, being someone who is so vested in the BBC, you've had such an extraordinary life on it. Um, and, you know, having been in control of it for that period of time as well, when you look at it now as a sort of custodian of the BBC, do you, it, oh, is it better or is it worse? How do you think it's doing? It's just very, very different. I mean, when, when you start, when I started in, 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 in uh, uh, 52, uh, the BBC was, was structured as though it was part of the civil service, really. I mean, our salaries as producers or directors or whatever were based on the civil service. And you didn't go there to make a, a big financial, get a big salary. You went there uh, as, really, I think you thought it was a life career. That, because, so that you, you're, you were looked after as a member of the staff and it never occurred to you that you would argue about uh, conditions of service or salary or that sort of stuff. But then, of course, um, when commercial te uh, television came, it changed the picture entirely. And, and, and that kind of civil service attitude um, uh, be began to dissolve and disappear. And um, public service television and the standards by which you um, made programmes and selected programmes was utterly different. Um, I used to think when I was running BBC Two that, that what television ought to do would be to uh, try and cover the whole spectrum of human interests and that you would manage, you would judge your success by the width of that spectrum and, and the, the absence of any gaps in it, so that you'd do jazz and you would do opera, and you would do fiction, you would do non-fiction, you would do all these things. If, you've got, if there's an audience for archaeology, you would certainly do archaeology. And you wouldn't be silly enough to suppose that a, 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 um, a programme about archaeology was going to get the same music, uh, audience as a programme about pop music. But what was that got to do with anything? You're, you're talking about a spectrum, and it's, it's held its position there for that reason. Well, that's changed. And that's changed. And that had to change, actually, um, because of, um, I suppose, the people who don't want the BBC to succeed. Um, and, and, and they will criticise 
the, the lack of audience, and they say, that's, that's a failure. You see, trust the BBC, fuddy old daddy BBC, you know, they keep put that programme in. Good. But what audience do we get? We don't want that. Well, now that's terrible. That is really terrible. Um, but, but the BBC has, ha has had to change for all kinds of reasons and in quite profound ways. That's interesting, though, that the, 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 the idea of using it for mi minority audiences was something that was incredibly important to you then. Y yes, but it's not just minority audiences. I mean, it's equally important that you, you did the, the old grey whistle test or whatever. Yeah. Uh, because of the spectrum notion. And the point was that you would be able to, people would go to the BBC for everything. And they would be, if they were accustomed to going to it for that reason, um, then maybe they would hang on and find something else. And actually we found that working, that was working. Do you know, do you know that now there are calls from within the BBC? I mean, the editor of BBC Four said that he no longer wants middle-aged men telling you how it is fronting up the programmes, that's... that's well, I, w I, would, I, I would take issue with him to suggest that, that actually uh, there are things that you, that you uh, are, are best able to convey by a human being talking. That's quite important. You don't have to have whiz-bang pictures all the time. There are sections of human interests and human knowledge that are best conveyed precisely by a man or a woman standing on a hillside and talking about something, if they're good enough. I agree, it's, they've got to be good, but there are plenty of people who are good. It doesn't, it doesn't affect you anyway, because it's middle-aged men and... That. <laughs> It doesn't affect me because I'm, I, I'm the lucky one. I've got all these animals, which, are, which you know, how can you go wrong with that? I showed that, that amazing clip, the one that was chosen by the entire country as, as their favourite ever David Attenborough moment. You know, the one with you and the lyrebird? Oh, yeah. Has everyone seen the clip, David and the lyrebird? Has anyone not seen it? This story's not going to go well, I can feel it. <laughs> But it was so extraordinary that when I showed it to my kids, they just went, it's Photoshop, Mum. It's not real. It doesn't actually happen like that. Mm. That's someone, you know, they've, they've made that in the edit, mm. but they hadn't. No, 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 no. Now, just in case, I'll fill in the story, the background, right? <laughs> a lyre bird is a, a, one of the kinds of birds that in order to show off to females, imitates the calls of other creatures, other birds, mostly. Uh, and the, the more vari variety, of more, the, the number of, of calls which they can imitate, the better the female thinks she is, and she would, she, on that basis, select to mate with the male lyrebird. And in some parts of Australia, uh, that there are enough people going through either cars or enough tourists watching, or natural history cameraman watching, so that the bird actually imitates the click of a camera. And there are even, and this is a sort of paradoxical and, and sad thing, is that this particular lyre bird imitated the sound of, uh, uh, of, of mechanical saws cutting down trees, so that they were singing of their own doom, which must mean some kind of paradoxical tragedy. And if you watch the clip, which I can advise you to do when you get back, um, as, as David talks about the lyrebird in front of it, the lyrebird begins, imita begins imitating his voice, and he's better than Rory Bremner. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's extraordinary. Yeah, isn't it? It? That's the bit nobody could believe. Um, let's talk a little bit about life on Earth. Gloriously, every single person in this room now owns a copy of your, it's your magnus opus, isn't it? Yes. I mean, it's yes. the most extraordinary life's work. Yes. It is a book which documents everything that you've seen on the planet. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what it does is to try and tell the history, a 3,000 million year old history of life from the very beginning to humanity in all its variety, as revealed by the, the history is revealed by the rocks, by the fossils, and the details are put in because you can find living examples of almost all the key creatures when you go through, so that um, you can show these extraordinary things happening and explain to people how it was that we come to be as we are today. 
And uh, th that was just the most um, exciting uh, thing that I could think of. Though I must say I was put in my place when I was trying to help raise money for this because we had to get um, co cooperative broadcasters to collaborate with us and, 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 and uh, pay for some of the, uh, contribute to the costs. Um, and I went through this stuff about you know, how exciting it is and how, com how we were going to do it completely and conscientiously and we were going to start right from the beginning and we'd go right through to humanity. And this chap was an American who said to me, you mean you're going to do 13 one-hour programs and the first one is all going to be about green slime? <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> he did. He said that. Anyway, that's what we did. Did you get the money? Not from him, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, we eventually, via Undergrowth and Cold Blood and First Life and so many of these extraordinary series, we get to Blue Planet, um, which I don't imagine there's anyone here who didn't see Blue Planet. Um, 14 million viewers, the highest UK viewing figure of 2017. Why? Um, I ask the same question. Um, and I think that the answer is that, that the natural world has an extraordinary fascination for us all. Uh, and it's a, a quality which I'm, every television producer who works in it is deeply grateful for, because there's a predisposition amongst the audience to look at, uh, at natural history programs. Uh, and that's never been greater than it's been in the past um, year or so. Because what's going on in the world around us is so deeply worrying. Every time if you, if you look at the news, you, you're worried stiff by terrible things that are happening in the world. Uh, so that you can almost come to where you really can't bear to, to know about it. Um, but that does mean that, that I think people have gone to natural history programs because they are beautiful, new, they're not trying to sell you anything. They're not trying to give you um, some kind of political um, uh, philosophy. Uh, and above all, they're true and they're beautiful. Well, what more do you want, you know? Um, and so w in these times when we are as worried as we are about what's happening both in the world, about in America, about Brexit, about all these other things, I think uh, natural history programs which are, are, are responsible and which show you the natural world as it is uh, have a lot to offer. This is everything that you don't like in an interview. But let me just run this by you. I've interviewed a lot of people, David, and I have never in my life had a response to um, people knowing who I was interviewing today at Cheltenham like the one that I've had. I mean, people don't just like you. They don't even just love you. They kind of deify you. You are genuinely an icon and a legend to so many people on this planet. And I was trying to work out why that is. I mean, obviously, you're handsome and you're, you know, all these things. <laughs> But there was clearly something more than that. And I think it might be that people's response to the natural world is so intense in the way you just beautifully described it. And because you are the conduit to that, all the emotions that people feel about the natural world, with which they don't normally engage in the urbanized world in which we live, get put onto you. And so you sort of embody all those things you were just saying about it's beautiful, it's true, it's honest, it's real. People, people imbue you with those qualities, and that's why when you walk into a room, as I've watched you doing for the last hour backstage, everyone goes completely silent because it's like Jesus is here. <laughs> <laughs> um, can we talk a little bit about the environment? Because uh, as you've gotten older, you've become much more. Um, active as an environmental campaigner. Your environmental messages have come through more and more strongly over the last 15 years, would it be? 
Yeah, I think if you look back, and, and heaven forbid that you should, but if you look back, I could produce programs that I made 25 years ago in which I was going on about population or whatever uh, for a very long period of time, uh, more longer than perhaps some people think. Um, but, but also, uh, if you, I was brought up as a public service broadcaster, and, and, and the, the one thing about perfect public service broadcasters is that they should keep their own personal views yeah. themselves. Um, and I felt that quite strongly. Uh, and I was quite sure that, that you, didn't, you didn't have to say what you happened to think in sort of vaguely was true, but you had, if you were going to make an opinion, give an opinion on an on issue, you had better be sure that it's right. And so I didn't uh, definitively say some of the things I felt about conservation until about on, t on, on air. Uh, until about 25, 30 years ago. Um, I, in private, I'm involved with, with a lot of conservation bodies of one sort or another. Uh, that's my private life. But I didn't let that swamp what I was saying on television. That, that's taking advantage of a, of a position of privilege. But eventually, it came to a situation when, when in the, it is, the evidence is so overwhelming and the consequences of ignoring it are so catastrophic that I had to, to say something about it and take a, post, take a position. Um, and, and even though there were politicians uh, and people of one kind or another of, of, of good repute who disagreed with it, uh, you simply had to say that the, the, the biological facts, the scientific facts, are, are simply incontroversible. Feeling how you do... Oh. Feeling the way that you do about this subject, um, I wish I could have seen your face. Actually, I don't wish I could have seen your face when President Trump pulled out of the Paris Agreement. That was such a tragedy. Um, I, I was involved peripherally, but I was involved in, in the, in the um, putting into the Paris Agreement this idea um, that we had to use um, natural resources and renewable energy, and if we could only collaborate worldwide with the scientific world worldwide and work out a path in which the various problems about generation, about storage, and about transmission could be dealt with, uh, we could solve the problem within 10 years. Um, and uh, we got agreement on that in, in Paris. And the, the government chief scientist, David King, uh, I was walking alongside him as he, as he came out, and he was walking on air. I mean, he, he was just, we've done it, he said. We've done it, we've got it. Um, and uh, it was a, a, a marvelous moment of feeling that we, humanity was making a step forward. Uh, and to have one of the most important signatories then to, to say, no, we're going to withdraw, was it was desperate, really. But I, I, I optimistic enough to think that, that actually the Americans won't withdraw as much as all that, and that in, as time goes by, the American people themselves will demand that, uh, that the, their government goes back on that and, and agrees to join the rest of the nations of the world in trying to deal with the huge problems that face us all. It, they are huge problems. I think one of the things that I massively appreciate about the way that you broadcast, things that you've said in your broadcast, is that you've given us so many solutions. I mean, to watch your shows, I mean, just in this week, in researching you, I learned that, you know, if we s use less plastic, buy less, grow more, convert to solar energy, have less children, vote in the right way, control the population, government investment and individual responsibility, we can actually knock this on the head. Also, people shouldn't live as long, which is why I think you at 92 is quite selfish. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Okay, okay, so this is, this is a question, an audience question, but it's um, through the Emirates Airline Festival of Literature in Dubai, who were one of the sponsors for today. And this is a question from Zachary Martin, who's nine years old. He says, which continent has the most endangered species today? Um, I would have to add them up, but um, at a guess, I would think it's Africa. Which ones are you most worried about? Which species? 
Um, well, actually, if I may say so, may I vary that question? It isn't so much a species as a whole community, ecological com communities that are disappearing. That's the problem. Um, and um, America, uh, Africa has a hugely uh, buoyant birth rate. I mean, the, the, the number of people, the population growth in Africa is, is very fast. Um, and they all need places to live. Uh, and where are they going to do it? Well, they're moving into land where, in fact, there was other rainforest or there was a savanna like in, the, uh, in, 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 in Eastern Africa. And that means there's less room for animals, um, as well as all the other problems of, of, of poaching for elephants and so on. So I think probably Africa has more endangered animals uh, than anywhere else. This is from somebody who came through the Travel Bag Travel Company, who are another of your sponsors. Um, they say, if you could speak and understand fluently the language of one species so that comprehensive two-way communication was possible, which species would you choose? If you could talk to the animal. <laughs> well, I think it would be a species which lived in a different in section of the Earth's environment. So either it would be um, a, a bird of one kind or another, or else uh, it would be something living in the seas. And I would probably pick a dolphin, really. Why? Because they are so versatile. Um, they, can, they are social animals. They take care of their, of their offspring. Uh, they have in interesting social arrangements among, the, among a pod. Uh, they travel widely. They encounter all sorts of things. They're extremely inquisitive. Um, I remember once, um, filming with a with a pod of dolphins with a researcher in the in the Caribbean and um, she said um, uh, the, the the dolphins will turn up at about quarter to eleven um, and you'll have to entertain them uh, you'll have, because they will come by and they will see you and they will wait for you to do something and if you don't do anything much they'll say what a boring lot they are and they will push off uh, hearing you talk um with so much uh, scientific background to what you're saying and so much knowledge and so much experience, I mean, you are the man who has seen more of our world than any other person on the planet. I know that you still feel, to some extent, like an imposter. Um, well, yes. I mean, I am an imposter. I mean, in all kinds of ways. I mean, uh, it is true I took a degree uh, in zoology and natural sciences at Cambridge a long time ago. Um, but I haven't been active in discovering new things. I, w I would, in the presence of a real scientist, by which I mean somebody who's working in research, and who actually can say, yes, I, I mapped that more part of the gene on a chromosome. I'm not a scientist. I'm, I'm uh, someone who is, is, takes their discoveries and tries to make them comprehensible to others. So I'm not really a scientist. And yet people sort of think that you are, which is well, where they, the imposter syndrome goes. Yeah, that they do. And, and, and they also think that I took all the, every shot in the film, you know. <laughs> And I keep saying, you know, there were 30 cameramen on this, and they say, yes, but um, what was it like when you were there? And I wasn't there. <laughs> I mean, the Life on Earth was 13 one-hour programs which traced the history of Life on Earth in a very systematic way, as I've explained earlier. Um, and nobody had done that before. And the mere fact that it was... It was um, looking at the thing as a continuum meant that there were whole stretches of it which nobody had ever made programs about before because they were thought, who wants to know about slugs? Well, now, actually, slugs have the most sensual, sexual behaviour <laughs> that you have ever seen, Miss Freud. Do they? No. Just... <laughs> the leopard slug, Miss Freud, produces a... A, a rope of mucus down which it climbs, and the other one then comes down the other way. I say the other one, not male and female, because as you would know, I do. Male, slugs are both male and female sure. simultaneously, you see. So they were transgender they, before it was fashionable. <laughs> yeah. 
So they do that, and they form this extraordinary balletic thing. Anyway, the fact is, we were talking about life on Earth. That was, that, <laughs> the fact is that by looking at it systematically, from amoeba to man, humanity, rather, um, meant that you couldn't cut corners. So we did programs about uh, groups of the animal kingdom that nobody had ever bothered about before or since. And so, as a, as a document, if I had to leave something and say, well, there you are, that's the sort of thing I did, and, and in a boastful kind of way, I would select Life on Earth. Beautiful. I would like you to join me in thanking Sir David Atten. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.